pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ashim Bhatia, which is an assistant professor for the Department of Radiology and a pediatric neuroradiologist um, that works in the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. And um, he's going to talk with us today about pediatric brain tumors. So it's an honor to moderate this session. I hope everyone enjoys it as much as I'm going to enjoy it because I really love the topic. So let's go, the word is all yours. All right, thank you, Delacqua. Appreciate the introduction and it's really great to be here. I'd like to thank Dr. Rahani for the invitation to present for Health Work for the World, which has been a great, uh, organization to be part of and truly an honor to be here and thank Ozzy for all the help in getting this set up as well. So yeah, this is a very important topic to me, pediatric brain tumors I spend a lot of time on, a lot of interest in, and a very important topic. Let me just move one second. I'm going to keep track of the questions we're going to discuss in the last 15 minutes. We're going to expect a 45 minutes talk. And thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you. So here are a few disclosures. Uh, and I'm a consultant for Gurbain, that's another disclosure. So the outline will discuss the World Health Organization classification uh, we'll go over some of the common tumors. And it's important to understand the world has a great classification because if you think about it, when you enter a tumor board, if you want to uh, discuss cases with your clinical colleagues in relationship to neuro-oncology, it's important to understand the world has a classification because a lot of the treatment plans, a lot of the prognosis comes from that exact uh, classification or the description of that tumor. So that is very important to understand. We're not gonna dive extremely deep into it. I just wanna give a little preview. The main focus will be discussing the most common uh, pediatric brain tumors and really the imaging findings of those tumors. And I'll give a little hint of what I think the future will be like with pediatric neurodiology in relationship to understanding these pediatric brain tumors. And so this is a kind of a glimpse into the future. If you were at the workstation, and a patient presented with this tumor, which we're scrolling through. This is a flare sequence showing a very hyper-intense mass within the pons. I know that went by pretty quick, but just give you a preview of that presented to your workstation. And you also got additional imaging. You got an ADC map. You got something we call a sodium MRI, which I won't go into, but you get more advanced imaging. In addition, you have radiomics, you have artificial intelligence working in the background while you're reading the report. So you have enough knowledge to describe the tumor. You can say this is likely a diffuse midline glioma. You might be even able to say the subtype. By the time you're finished reading your report, there's a, a good chance that the radiomics and AI algorithm have already evaluated all of the imaging to give you the subtype of the tumor. They can help confirm your imaging findings. So imagine, Within an hour or two after the imaging was completed, not only can you give the subtype of the tumor, the, the type of the tumor, you can also predict a prognosis. You can possibly predict what treatment plan is best for this patient. And this is all within hours of imaging being, being obtained. So that's the way I envision the future. Um, and we're getting closer. As you see, there's a lot of more work being done on radiomics and AI. So that's kind of the future of uh, pediatric radiology in this field. But before I get into how great radiology is and how amazing we are, um, let's also humble ourselves that it can be challenging just to diagnose tumor. So here's a, a four-year-old presenting with altered mental status after a fall. And the patient actually said, something is wrong with me to um, her mother. And what you see here, this, this is actually a case that I had at the workstation, a neurosurgeon called me early in the morning. Hey, he said, what do you think about this case? So over here on a non-contrast CT, there's a hyperdense mass. And here's a flare sequence that's scrolling through. You'll see multiple flare lesions throughout. So here's flare up intensity, uh, left temporal lobe, there's brainstem involvement, there's thalamic involvement. There's a lot of signal automatic going on in addition to this dominant mass. 
If you look at the DWI sequence, there's reduced diffusion in left temporal lobe. And if you look at the post-contrast sequence, there's a little focus of an enhancement right there in the right temporal lobe. So you have a lot of going on in the brain. And the question was, is this definitely a tumor? I was pretty convinced with the imaging findings that we're dealing with a neoplastic process. Some people weren't as convinced. And actually the spine imaging was normal, you can see here. And I don't know, are my uh, videos showing there? I'm trying to hide these videos real quick. One second, sorry. And we'll just leave it for now, but this turned out to be tumor. The question was, is this some type of encephalitis case? But you can see how challenging it can be in some cases just to determine that this is tumor. So while I'm saying we can go to types and subtypes, let's first start with determining tumor versus other processes such as inflammatory encephalitis type of cases. So here's another example. The question was, is this tumor encephalitis? So again, this is similar. You get flare hyperintense lesions within the brain, within the, the deep gray matter, brain stem, cerebral hemisphere. Some areas of questionable reduced diffusion there. And what was done here in this case was uh, MR spectroscopy. So a red voxel depicts this data point this orange voxel depicts this data point. And if you plot the myonostal versus NA ratio here on the curve, you can see encephalitis actually has a lower ratio versus the, the neoplasm. Astrocytomas have a higher ratio there. And so this actually turned out to be neoplasm because MR spectroscopy kind of confirmed those findings. And if you look at it, this was a multicentric gliomatosis um, on imaging, the, the appearance was. so. They can be challenging up front, but you can also use uh, more advanced imaging tools to make these uh, diagnoses a little more clear. Uh, I have this slide up because in pediatrics, we try to lump everything into pediatrics. Like all, all patients are 18 years old, these are their pediatric brain tumors, but take it to the next level, I actually differentiate the age group. So this will help you just in putting a good differential out there. If you look at the difference in the age groups between zero to four year old, five to nine year old, and 10 to 14 year old, you can see that there's a difference in uh, the tumors, the most common tumors. So the most common tumors early on are embryonal tumors. And you can see in the 10 to 14 age group, that's already not one of the top four. So just knowing uh, the age of the patients can help you put a, uh, what the most likely diagnosis and help you kind of think about, is this tumor fit? this age group. So that's also something to consider. Here's some common examples we'll discuss today. Just a general look at all these tumors. And so in 2016, there was an update to the CNS classification. That was new at, in 2016. And then for a few years, I kept on saying new on all my slides. I was like, this is still new? Well, it's 2018. Should we still call it new? Well, 2021 is approaching in about a month or two, we're gonna get another update to the World Health Organization classification system. Uh, so it's not really new anymore for 2016, but it's new for 2021. So stay tuned in about probably the next month or two, you'll see a, a brand new update, which I'll give some preview of what those updates will include. So with the blue book, this is, this is the, the WHO updates have been going for the last, since 1979, the first edition. There was also one in 1993, in 2000, and 2007. And in 2016, this was an update, a CNS update. It wasn't actually a complete edition. So the fifth edition is coming this year. And it'll have its own dedicated uh, pediatric volume as well. And what, what we're looking at with the pathologic diagnosis is, these layered uh, pathology reports. So layer one is a, a kind of a co combination of everything. Layer two and three are based on histology. And layer four is the molecular information. So this is your integrated diagnosis. And this is just an example of how a uh, pathology report will be depicted um, based on these layers. And you can see that molecular information is extremely important. So that's layer four. Here's an example of multiple molecular tests that you can obtain, right? This is a, a long list, gliomas, embryonal tumors. I'm not gonna go into a lot of details of all of these. I'm gonna mention a few that are important, but you can see there's a lot 
being learned about these. Um, there's more molecular integration than ever before. And 2016 was the first time there was molecular integration into the, the WHO organization. So the more we understand as radiologists of molecular information, molecular information, the more we can conversate with our clinical colleagues. And everyone always asks, what's your brain tumor protocol? So I kind of just put a, a quick flash of what our protocol currently is being worked on. So this is kind of our goal. Uh, if you have a patient with no residual tumor on the last MRI, it's kind of a follow-up quick MRI. And we also have advanced brain tumor protocol for our newer residual tumor. So it includes a little more advanced imaging such as ASL or perfusion imaging. But you also want to pay attention to the response assessment and pediatric neuro-oncology committee. So the RATHNO committee, um, which I'm a part of as well, we're, we're developing your, the most important sequences. So essential sequences that should be obtained in certain pediatric brain tumors. So if you look at uh, medulloblastoma, these are all important papers to pull up. So at your institution, you should be doing at a minimum, hopefully these type of sequences. Um, so in brain, these six sequences are essential for medial blastoma. And then recently, uh, there also were guidelines for low-grade glioma, DIPGs, and high-grade glioma. So definitely take a look at this. And a, a lot of institutions, it's also challenging to, to get MRI in some cases. So it's not that you can't make a diagnosis on CT. You can't get imaging findings on CT that are very helpful. But really, when it comes down to it, to, to get the best characterization of tumors, MRI is the modality of choice, choice. So this is just something to help you in this case if you need to um, develop a protocol. And here we go, the groups of tumors we'll be discussing today, quite a few of them. So let's get started with diffuse astrocytic and oligodendroglial tumors. And in 2021 classification coming up in a few months, you're gonna see that there's gonna be this high-grade glioma diffuse type. So this group of tumors is gonna include diffuse midline glioma, H3K27 altered. It's gonna include diffuse hemispheric glioma, H3G34 mutant. It's gonna include uh, diffuse pediatric type, high-grade glioma, H3 wild type, IDH wild type, and an infant type hemispheric glioma. There's also adult type we won't go into, but just to give you an idea of how this um, classification system is gonna work. So we'll go over diffuse middle glioma, but we won't really go over these tumors. So here's an example of a classic DIPG where you have a flare hypertense mass, that arrow is pointing to encasement of the basal artery. There's expansion of the pons. There's a minimal enhancement. You can see here on the sagittal, the expansion of the pons very nicely. So this is consistent with DIPG, but DIPG is no longer used in the in the WHO classification, they're now uh, diffuse midline glioma H3K27M mutant tumors. And there's different subtypes. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail of uh, these subtypes, but they're, the more important ones are like 3.1 and the 3.3 subtypes. The 3.1 is only in the pond. So the kind of why these subtypes are important is because uh, the behavior of these tumors are different. So here are some examples of the diffuse midline glioma H3, K27, and mutants. Here you got T2 hyperintense infiltrative masses, bilateral thalamic, player hyperintense, bilateral thalamic, uh, better characterization of them, no enhancement, and no reduced diffusion. So that's one example. Here's another example. So look at, this is a, the other case was bilateral thalamic. This one's unilateral, another diffuse midline glioma where there's infiltrative tumor within the right thalamus, there's some reduced diffusion and minimal enhancement. So this is also a little different than other tumor where there's reduced diffusion and enhancement on this one. Here's another example, another different presentation, another imaging finding that's different than the other cases. So this is a chronal post-contrast T1 sequence. We can see that there's a cystic component within the region of the right thalamus. There's diffuse metastatic disease throughout the spine, all of this enhancement along the cord within the distal thecal sac along the caudal corner nerve roots, that's all metastatic disease. 
and this has rim enhancement along the cystic component. So you can see the, the variability in imaging is quite large. This is actually a spinal H3 K27 mutant. These are, this uh, paper had two, two cases of it. But the point of this, showing all this, is that there's so much variability in how these tumors present. You have unilateral, you have bilateral. Uh, we can have enhancement, reduced diffusion. Um, so there's something to keep in mind that as we learn more about these tumors, um, these imaging findings can still be variable. So it can be difficult to say that it's definitely going to look like this. It's definitely going to be unilateral, definitely bilateral, because so far the literature supports that there's a lot of variability in these tumors. I wanted to make a point on uh, diffusion tensor imaging because we're talking about infiltrating tumors. When we try to differentiate infiltrating tumors, like what does it really mean to be an infiltrating tumor? DTI kind of helps in this case. If you think about the central nervous system is made of gray matter, white matter, a well-structured um, well component or anatomy, and these membranes within the brain provide barriers for diffusion. And when you have these barriers, you have uh, anisotropic diffusion. So anisotropic diffusion, um, and you compare that to isotropic diffusion, that is, this is within normal brain, this is within abnormal brain. But really what I'm getting at is this can help in understanding diffusion tensor imaging because DTI is just an advanced form of diffusion where you can actually look at displacement or diffusivity and infer the tractography, right? So we're used to seeing the tractography within tumors. And how can this be helpful in this case? Well, let's compare this first to, um, to a low-grade tumor here. This is a DNET, a bubbly lesion, has a flare-up intense sign. So this is a low-grade tumor. And a low-grade tumor is going to displace what you see here is the cortical spinal tracts. So all of these uh, green fibers here, the cortical spinal tracts being displaced around the tumor. Now let's compare that to an infiltrative tumor. So here you have uh, the lamic lesion on the right. It looks very infiltrative. So when you think about infiltrative, it kind of dives deep into the brain tissue. And it's not displacing the cortical spinal tracts. It's actually infiltrating throughout them. And the point of this is we, this one, this case actually came to me because a neurosurgeon wanted to prove to the uh, patient basically to say, if we were to surgically resect this tumor, there's going to be a lot of complications because the cortical spinal tracts run through the tumor. When you compare it to a tumor like this, where the cortical spinal tracts are being displaced around it, there's going to be less complications or less side effects, obviously, from this resection versus this. And this is how DTI can help. And also, it gives you an idea how an infiltrating tumor actually works, infiltrating through the brain, not kind of displacing the brain around it. And like I said, there's going to be a Stay tuned for the classification system and other imaging findings. This is the other one we mentioned. The H3.3 also has uh, poor prognosis similar to the K27 mutant. There also will be a diffuse type low-grade glioma. So we discussed the high-grade glioma, diffuse types, the group of them. There's also a low-grade glioma version. And so here's uh, angiocentric glioma and plenty tumors. We'll discuss those two. These other ones we won't be discussing today. And here's the angiocentric glioma. The plenty tumor will be in the mixed uh, neural glial tumor group. So we'll get to that in a, in a little bit. Uh, but for the angiocentric glioma, for most part, they kind of look, this is also early in our understanding of these, relative understanding of these tumors. Let's stay tuned for more, more literature to support this because it's still relatively rare. Um, but they're kind of, lobular appearance, and I'll show an example in a little bit, but this one has maybe minimal enhancement. Here's a little better example, where the borders look well-defined medially, but laterally and anteriorly, they're more ill-defined. So that might be that infiltrative component to the angiocentric glioma. And these, this patient also presented with seizures. Again, not much enhancement there, actually on the Crohn T1, but here there's some enhancement on the axial um, and again, kind of infiltrate of appearance to components of the tumor. Again, infiltrate of component to the medial aspect of the tumor. 
and another one in a 12 year old is now in the left frontal lobe, where there are margins of this tumor that look more ill defined or infiltrative. And here on the post contrast, uh, no significant enhancements. So now let's look at other astrocytic tumors. And if you look at the, the MAC kinase pathway, the BRAF is an important regulator of, the, of this pathway. And so if there's a mutation in this, you can also have alterations and are leading to um, neoplasm. So we talk about the BRAF mutation quite a bit because it's an important regulator. And the two uh, mutations you should think about or molecular um, modifications are the BRAF fusion, which is in a majority of pilocytic astrocytomas with a good prognosis. You also have a BRAF V600E point mutation. And if a pilocytic astrocytoma you want to compare the two, why is it important? This V600 point mutation has a worse outcome compared to the BRAF fusion. And so a classic imaging findings of a pilocytic astrocytoma you got a cystic mass with an enhancing neural nodule. We always think poster fossa. So this is your classic imaging presentation. So cystic mass, here's your T2. There's no reduced diffusion within it. Pyrocytics should not have reduced diffusion unless there's some blood products associated with it. And there's an enhancing neural nodule. This is your post-contrast T1. And presenting with hydrocephalus, obviously, because there's obstruction of the fourth ventricle. But pilocytic astrocytomas don't always follow the classic imaging presentation. In this case, there's more of a heterogeneous tumor, kind of has little cystic components throughout. So here's your T2, heterogeneous appearing, has a lot, kind of heterogeneous enhancement throughout. And again, more of a heterogeneous appearance with well defined borders still. So don't be fooled by um, the kind of multi-cystic component to it. It's still well-defined, still more commonly will be a pilocytic astrocytoma in this case, which it was. And these tumors also can present as exophytic components. Here off the medulla, you see an enhancing component with a cystic component. So again, it has a cystic component, enhancing neural um, nodule or enhancing component to it. So still, pilocytic astrocytoma, even though it's exophytic and doesn't really follow your classic post fossa presentation, still imaging findings consist with pyelocytoma. You also see pyelocytomas commonly as hypothalamic optic pathway gliomas, as in this case, especially in uh, NF1 patients. You'll see uh, heterogeneous tumors, the kind of heterogeneous enhancement. There we go, a nice sagittal post-contrast view of the tumor. We have enhancement and cystic components throughout. So this is your classic optic pathway glioma. This turned out to be a BRAF V600E mutation. And here's one with a BRAF fusion. So imaging wise, you can't differentiate the two, right? We have the point mutation, you have the BRAF fusion. This is another optic pathway glioma with, this is sagittal post contrast showing a lot of enhancements, no reduced diffusion. But the point is, Imaging wise, you can say pyelocytic astrocytoma, um, but you can't. We're at this point, we're not at the level where we can say what type of mutation we're dealing with. That's down the road and kind of the future of uh, pediatric neuroradiology. So we also discussed uh, neuronal and mixed neuronal glial tumors. This is an important group because a lot of these tumors are common tumors you'll see especially D-nets, we'll discuss those, and ganglioma. So D-nets, when you think about these tumors, they have very classic imaging findings. So when you see them, you should be very confident with the diagnosis on imaging. And that is a bubbly bunch of grapes appearance of the tumor. So bunch, kind of grapes appearance, you see that? This is a T2 sequence showing that it has kind of like a grape-like what they call a bubbly appearance. Again, on the sagittal view, T2 kind of has a grape-like appearance. And you also see this hyperintense rim flare sign on D-nets. It has an axial flare showing the periphery of the tumor showing this hyperintensity on flare. 
and really no enhancement on this one. I'll show you some other examples where you'll get a little nodular enhancement with these DNFs. Here's another good example, kind of grape-like appearance, the hyperintense rim flare sign. And on CT, they're usually corically based tumors. You might see some smooth remodeling of the inner table of the calvarium, such as in this case. This is nothing specific to DNETs, but it supports that this is a low-grade glioma. So other tumors can also cause um, remodeling of the inner table, such as a PXA. But this just is a supportive imaging finding to show that this is a low-grade glioma. In this case, the MR helps you depict that this is a DNET. Here's another example. So T2, not as great example of a bubbly appearance, but it has a little enhancing component. And that's usually what you see when you see a DNET enhancing, a little enhancing nodule next to it. This also has the hyperintense rim flare sign. So another classic example on flare. Trying to find the, it's covering my image here on the T2, but it did have a very bubbly appearance on the axial T2 here, hyperintense rim flare sign, and then there's a little enhancing nodule again. So this is another example of how the enhancement is within the DNET. So classic imaging findings, when you see it, the bubbly appearance, hyperintense rim flare sign, and don't be fooled by contrast enhancement. You might get a little enhancing nodule. Think DNET. Gangliomas, how do you compare them to DNETs? A lot of times your differential might include both of them, but they're more heterogeneous, they're more likely to get calcifications. There might be more heterogeneous enhancement. So this is much more enhancement than you see with DNETs, a little more heterogeneous in appearance of the tumor, has cystic solid components. Here's a more similar appearance to a DNET. This is a ganglioma as well. You see there's a more enhancement of the tumor here. T2 shows that it's for the most part well-defined and has some hyperintensity to it, but it's, um, you could easily put DNET in differential in this case. So a lot of them are similar. Here's a tumor that when you see it, another one that you can be pretty confident with the diagnosis if it presents with uh, clinical history, the right clinical history, and also with these imaging findings. So when you see a very large mass like this, these are masses you won't miss usually. And I'll, I'll show you a case next that uh, can be challenging. But in most cases, when they present, they're going to look like this. Huge masses, cystic components. The enhancing components are going to be very plaque-like or along the periphery of the mass. They're going to be young patients presenting with seizures. So less than five years of age are a majority. They present with macrocephaly and seizures. So when you see this large hemispheric predominantly cystic mass, with solid components less than six months of age, number one, two, and three diagnosis is a DIG, or what we call desmoplastic infantile astrocytoma and ganglioma. Um, you should definitely think about DIG in this case. And this is the case I was saying, usually they're not, usually this is how they present, but this patient was actually imaged uh, for another indication early on in the one, at one week of life. And you can see in the right parietal lobe near the cortex, there's this abnormal signal. Here's a chrono T2, T1 showing some abnormal signal. And just within eight months, look how large this developed. This signal abnormality developed, it was probably obviously some type of neoplastic tissue underlying it, developed into this large cystic mass, enhancing plaque-like components. This one actually had uh, reduced diffusion within it. This is DWI. ADC map. And so this was also a dig tumor with anaplastic components to it. And this reduced diffusion kind of suggests this is a more highly cellular, possibly the anaplastic component, but just look within the short time interval how large this mass got. Another important tumor is a diffuse leptomeningeal glioneural tumor. These patients usually present with a lot of leptomeningeal disease. The challenge with this type of tumor is you usually don't see the dominant mass within the case. So a lot of times we're used to seeing, here's the dominant mass and there's metastatic disease throughout. But in this case, you might not see the, the dominant 
tumor right away or the dominant lesion, what you'll see is enhancement within the supracellular cistern, within the basal cisterns, all these abnormal leptomeningeal enhancement. But the clue to the diffuse leptomeningeal glioneural, tu glioneural tumor is there are these little T2 lesions within the cerebellar folia. See that T2 components there? Smaller T2 ones there. But there's also diffuse disease throughout the spine. I'll show another example that's a little better. So again, diffuse enhancement throughout the spinal cord through the carotid nerve roots representing metastatic disease. And when you look for the, the dominant lesion, look number one, spinal cord. That's gonna be the number one site of these tumors. If you get high resolution imaging of the spinal cord, we actually had a case recently where we where I got high resolution imaging, you could only see it because the metastatic disease was so diffuse, you can actually see the primary lesion barely because there was so much mass effect on the cord. So when you're looking for it, this is um, your sagittal T2, oh, sorry, sagittal T2 and axial post contrast. And this is the, the dominant lesion in this case. So this is your diffuse leptomeningeal glial neural tumor. And they present with hydrocephalus because they get obstruction of the outflow, outflow tracts because of all the metastatic disease. And as a 12 year old also, diffuse leptomeningeal glial neural tumor. You can see the dominant lesion within the spinal cord showing enhancement. So always look in the spinal cord. And a lot of times what happens is you'll get the brain imaging and you'll see all this enhancement. You need to make sure to add the spinal cord or spine imaging to look at the spinal cord for these lesions. Here's a good example of the T2 lesions that are seen with this tumor, diffuse leptomeningeal glial glioneural tumor, where you get these little T2 hyperintense components throughout the cerebellar folia. So yeah, this will be, in addition to 2001 classification, there'll be subtypes, no need to go into it right now, just so you're aware. And we talked about the uh, pediatric type diffuse low-grade glioma. I mentioned we're going to talk about a tumor called Plenty. So the polymorphous low-grade neuropathial tumor of the young. With this, remember, there's a strong association with epilepsy. And the tumors might have, the literature is still developing. I think it's going to take some time for us to be very confident with this. But they're going to have the salt and pepper sign. So on the T2, you see this kind of, this is a T2 in this case. You kind of see these like peppered or hypointense regions within the tumor. And there's another example here that's actually a little better. So this kind of salt and pepper appearance, this is on the flare, but you kind of get these dotted appearance within the tumor. And when you have this dense calcification within it, think of a plenty tumor. So salt and pepper sign, dense calcifications, seizure related. This is most likely going to be your imaging clues. All right, so we're going to move on to embryonal tumors. And so the reason I put this slide up there is because PNETs are no longer in the World Health Organization classification. So the WHO 2016 removed PNETs. And I wanted to make a point that it can be challenging in radiology to understand uh, imaging findings of tumors because we completely removed this tumor. There's a lot of literature on peanuts. So, what were all the what were all these peanuts? How would they be classified if you went back to look at them now? And so, this study actually did that. It looked at 323 peanuts, and there was a wide variability in what these tumors actually were. So, you would think they're all embryonal tumors. Whether some of them were embryonal tumors with multi layered rosettes, some were ATRTs, but some were also ependymomas, some were pineoblastomas or other variability of tumors or PXAs. So the variability in the peanuts or what the peanuts were is quite diverse. So it's hard to use that literature to say uh, the imaging finding of the peanuts now is equivalent to this tumor because you would have to actually go back reclassify the tumors and then look at the imaging findings. So you can see the challenge every time there's a new classification system is some tumors are removed, some are added, and it's up to us to be on top of this um, 
to look at the, the imaging, to come up with imaging findings that are consistent with these tumors. So it keeps us definitely on, on our toes for sure. So let's talk about medulloblastomas. These are important subtypes. If you can remember any subtypes, uh, it should be medulloblastoma where you got wind tumors, sonic hedgehog, sonic hedgehog, uh, group three and group four tumors. And what I want to show here is like, why would you, what is the importance of this? So subtypes have different behaviors. If you look at survival, wind tumors have very good survival, where group three have poor survival. So it's important to know the subtypes. If you look at the location, a lot of studies early on said that wind tumors were CP angle, sonic hedgehog were cerebellar hemisphere, and group three and group four were midline tumors. Well, that's not always the case. And I'll give you an example in a little bit. Um, but in 2021, how is the medulloblastoma going to be uh, structured or what are the subtypes? You're going to have a sonic hedgehog activated. That's going to be TP53 wild type. And a sonic hedgehog activated with the TP53 mutant. You still have the WINT activated. And basically group three, group four, the non-WINT, non-sonic hedgehog. And you also have a histologically defined group. And that's going to be coming up in a few months. So just stay tuned on the final, final classification, but that's likely what it's going to look like. And when you talk about the wind tumors, we were thinking most of them are CP angle. Well, this study helped prove us wrong. There's a, a bunch of midline tumors. Look at all these. These are all wind tumors. They're all midline, not CP angle. Uh, well, I should say a majority are midline in the study, but in this case, or this image, a lot of these tumors are midline. On the susceptibility, there's a lot of hemorrhage within them. And some of them have these little cystic components. See that arrow there? So what they actually found in this study was wind tumors are predominantly midline. So 66% of the, the tumors in this case were midline. In addition, the most important imaging findings might be that there's intratumoral hemorrhage or blood de degradation and cystic components. So those two imaging clues might help differentiate wind tumors from the other subtypes. And this is just showing the subtypes could get even more complex if you really want them to. With methylation classification, you could go into like 11 subgroups. So the future is probably going to head in this direction with more subtypes. And also I should mention the World Health Organization classification is going to be producing more frequent updates. So I showed earlier the gaps were pretty long between the blue books. Those blue books are becoming more frequently, like every four to five years. And classically, medulloblastoma, what does it look like? Well, you got a poster fossa mass with reduced diffusion. Here's the DWI sequence, bright, dark on ADC. Susceptibility, there's some blood products here, and you get some heterogeneous enhancement. I don't know the subtype in this case, but I'll show you some examples of different ones where we know the subtype. So in this case, another medulloblastoma centered in the fourth ventricle. DWI is bright, reduced diffusion, heterogeneous enhancement on the post-contrast sagittal T1. And here's another one. We talked about wind tumors just earlier. And look at this case. So here we have very dark on ADC, reduced diffusion, consistent with medulloblastoma. A lot of blood products. This is the, the gradient sequence, or SWI is showing susceptibility, heterogeneous enhancement. So this is the wind tumor we just discussed that these tumors will more likely have hemorrhagic components. And that's what's going on in this case. There's a wind tumor, blood products, midline. And this is not from the, this is not from that uh, study. This is an actual case that was given or at the workstation. So here's another case, sonic, sonic hedgehog, medulloblastoma with extensive nodularity. This is going more into the uh, histologic, histologic classification, but just so you know, they can also appear a little more um, heterogeneous than the ones we've seen earlier. This one's showing a 
hyper intensity on the DWI, dark AC. So it shows a reduced diffusion, but it's definitely a little more heterogeneous than the other tumors, but still consistent with the sonic hedgehog in the cerebellar hemisphere. Another measurable blastoma, this was a non wint non-sonic hedgehog. ASL showing increased perfusion to tumor, not surprising. But uh, close contrast showing enhancement. Again, DWI showing reduced diffusion. So make sure you get a good quality DWI sequence to help differentiate this tumor from other tumors in the posterior fossa. They can present with metastatic disease, as in this case. Throughout the spine, you see the diffuse leptal meningeal disease. Well, what else do you see on this sequence? There's an axial post-contrast sequence. There's something going on in the liver, multiple enhancing lesions throughout the liver. These are metastatic disease, metastatic disease from the medullary blastoma. So group three and group four tumors are more likely to have extra neural metastases than the other subtypes. So always pay attention to your axial post-contrast of the spine because they can metastasize to sites outside of the, the spinal cord. And when you see a tumor that looks like medulloblastoma, but in a younger age group, think about atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor. They're going to have reduced diffusion. They're going to be more heterogeneous in appearance, more likely to have blood products. As you can see, this tumor is a little more heterogeneous. Let me get that video to run again. Here's your axial CT, showing some blood products there. And with the hyperdensity, sometimes it could be a component of calcifications in hemorrhage, but more likely hemorrhage resulting in hydrocephalus in this case. Here's another one centered in the fourth ventricle, very large heterogeneous tumor. This is on the sagittal T1, showing kind of heterogeneous enhancement, but a lot of susceptibility. So that was also ATRT. And in this case, another heterogeneous tumor, reduced diffusion. This is the DWI sequence. Kind of has peripheral T2 hyperintense or cystic components, maybe, and heterogeneous enhancement. So if you see a tumor that looks like medulloblastoma, but in a patient about one to two years of age, it also looks a little more heterogeneous with more blood pro products, think about ATRT. And ATRTs can not only present poster fossa, they also can be supraconsultorial. And they also can present in unusual locations like quite a few cases I've seen now along the third cranial nerve. Here's at presentation, where you see this enhancing lesion along the right third cranial nerve along the sternal segment. And shortly after, it enlarged in size. The clue to the diagnosis, a lot of times you'll think schwannoma. But if you look, there's going to be a reduced diffusion within these ATRTs. Here's a nice high quality DWI showing uh, hyperintensity on DWI, dark ADC. So when you see that reduced diffusion associated with these lesions, think of ATRT. Here's another example, different patient. And this is the case actually from the ASPNR case of the week, where you have enhancement along the Right third cranial nerve, again, DWI is showing hyperintensity. There's reduced diffusion. There's also a lot of metastatic disease in this case. So they can metastasize even from the third cranial nerve. So think about isolated lesion, third cranial nerve, reduced diffusion, young patient, um, ATRT. 2021 classification subtype are listed here. I'm not gonna go into the details, but just so you know. Here's another interesting tumor that you should be aware of, embryonal tumor with multi-layered rosettes, formerly e -tanter. And really the imaging findings, think about it this way, a large mass with poor enhancement, significant mass effect, but not, not much surrounding vasogenic edema. And this is the molecular subtypes that you'll see in this tumor. Um, we won't go into details again, but this is how the 2021 classification is going to look. So again, this is a poor enhancement, large mass. This is the embryonic tumor with multilayered rosettes. So it's not much surrounding vasogenic edema, right? A lot of mass effect and very minimal enhancements. So this is what you're gonna be looking for. Another example, 
very large mass causing midline shift. Minimal T1 shortening there, maybe minimal enhancement, some reduced diffusion, but really not much surrounding vasogenic edema. For a, a mass of that size, um, you could put embryonic tumor with multi rosettes in the differential. We'll now go over um, ependymal tumors, ependymoma, third most common tumor in children. And we'll kind of talk about the classic imaging findings. This is your classic imaging finding where you have a mass center in the fourth ventricle extending through the foramen magendi and lushka, very extending through the magendi into the foramen magnum. You get that peg like appearance. No definite uh, reduced diffusion. You also get extension to the foramen of lushka. And then CT here is slightly hyperdense. Think about pendomoma. So when you see those classic imaging findings, you should think of a pendomoma. And the classification is going to, again, this is important to understand. We won't go into a lot of details of it, but just enough that you're aware the supersensorial pendomomas were initially thought to be a Relay subtype, but it's actually going to be a C11 ORF95 fusion positive and a YAP1. So this is going to be the two subtypes in supersensorial pendomomas. And why is it important again? Look at survival, poor prognosis with the C11 ORF95 fusion. And for infratentorial pendomomas, there's a poster fossa A and B subtype. Majority and number wise, as far as the most common one is poster fossa B, 80% compared to the PFA. And again, there's a difference in survival. Poor survival with poster fossa A subtype versus poster fossa B. And again, classic imaging findings kind of have a heterogeneous mass in the center and fourth ventricle extending through the foramen lushka, through the foramen magendi, into the foramen magnum, you get that peg-like appearance. And supernatorial uh, tumors, we mentioned RELA, it's actually going to be C11 or 95, but um, it could still have a RELA component to it. You see in this case, there's actually reduced diffusion within this mass. It's heterogeneous. It also has heterogeneous enhancement. And so this is um, an example of a, a pendomo supersensorial. And then I won't go into the additional details. We kind of discussed some of these subtypes already. There's going to be a spinal pendomoma as well as subtype. There's also going to be the mix of papillary of a pendomoma. There's going to be a subependomoma. So a lot of changes. I mean, actually, a lot of those we're quite familiar with, but it's going to be kind of a new structural uh, look at ependymomas with the subtypes. So the last group I'm going to talk about is uh, choriplexus papilloma. Another interesting group because the imaging findings are very classic. When you see these imaging findings, again, you can be very confident with the, the diagnosis on imaging. And the challenge sometimes comes differentiating the papilloma, which is grade one, versus the choriplexus carcinoma, which is um, a grade three. And other thing I forgot to mention for the next two classification, they're going to be using uh, Arabic numbers, no more, no more Roman numerals. So this will be just um, Arabic numbers when you see the changes. And uh, if you look at the choriplexus papilloma, you're going to get a very classic imaging finding. You're going to get this cauliflower or frond like enhancement pattern. And that's what you're seeing in this case. This is the axial CT. The, the mass is centered in the third ventricle, extending into the lateral ventricles. Better seen on the, the MRI. So, this is post contrast imaging of the brain where you see the frond like enhancement. Look at that. Kind of does look like a cauliflower extending through the frame and row into the lateral ventricles. So when you see that, think of choriplexus papilloma. Here's another example. This one's actually centered in the fourth ventricle. So this is the post-contrast T1. You get that frond like enhancement. And you also have a coronal post-contrast showing the frond like enhancement. There's a facilitated diffusion. But when you see that enhancement pattern, very diffuse enhancement, frond like choriplexus papilloma. And in choriplexus carcinoma, how do you differentiate it? Sometimes it's challenging. You can't always say for sure. But when you do see parenchymal invasion with surrounding edema, think of choriplexus carcinoma. 
just want to make a quick point on the MR spectroscopy. This is an interesting case. And not this case, I'm going to show a case in a little bit. Um, but it's based off MR spectroscopy. So what, what I want everyone to remember is when chorea plexus papilloma, the myonositol, the metabolite, is higher than choline versus chorea plexus carcinoma, the choline is higher than the my, myonositol. If you want to remember it, think about carcinoma C, C, choline. Those two are linked. So the choline is higher in carcinomas. And this is the case. So here's sibling A. They had an ATRT, so a very large enhancing tumor. Sibling B was being screened because they also this patient also had the P53 tumor suppressor gene mutation. And in the left lateral ventricle, just slightly, you can see over here, a little enhancing lesion in the left lateral ventricle. But nothing really too concerning. At the worst, you could think maybe a chorea plexus papilloma. But MR spectroscopy was done in this case. And a quick point on how long it took to make an adequate um, voxel. This actually took about 20 minutes to obtain this single voxel MR um, profile. Because the size of the lesion was so small, the voxel had to be decreased. The next had to be increased, result in a very long sequence. So 20 minutes required just this one voxel, but it was helpful because the choline was elevated compared to the myonositol. And we said elevated choline suggests carcinoma. And that's what it was in this case. This was actually a chorea plexus carcinoma, not based off of conventional imaging, but based off of the MR spectroscopy. And so when I think about the future of pediatric neurology in relationship to neuro-oncology, I think radiomics and AI is going to play a huge role in our understanding. So definitely stay up to date on the literature as more and more is coming out. Definitely area I'm interested in. And you can see radiomics, AI is helping not only with diagnosis, but in predicting prognosis, predicting treatment responses, a lot of interesting literature coming out. And when I see the future, we talked about the layer classification for the World Health, World Health Organization or for pathology in general. I think radiology and radiomics will play a key role in this uh, future classification and possibly be an additional layer in defining these tumors. And from the Pennsylvania chapter of Health for the World, it's definitely a true honor, a pleasure to be here. To be able to present to everyone, so I want to thank everyone for logging in and being a part of this session. Um, also, thanks to Vice President uh, Dr. Hanzo Otero and his Secretary Monica Miranda with great team members. Um, if you're interested, we have great presenters coming from the Pennsylvania chapter. We just had Dr. Frank Lexa present recently. We have the always amazing Dr. Aaron Simon Schwartz presenting from CHOP on 5721. Dr. Alessandro Furland from UPMC presenting in July. Dr. Narendra Gupta presenting from Penn in July as well. And Dr. Jenny Bencardino presenting from Penn in October. So we got a lot of interesting um, presenters coming from Pennsylvania and every week, amazing presenters from Health for the World. So stay tuned, there's gonna be more and more um, presentations, take a look at the video library for past presentations as well. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful talk, very comprehensive. And uh, I believe that radiomics for sure is going to help us a lot in the near future and not replace us. Yeah, <laughs> I exactly. believe you think as well. Yeah, we're we'll definitely will be. Uh, an additional tool to help us, not so much replace us. <laughs> yes. And um, I don't see any questions from the audience, but I would like to ask you one. So considering the mutations, we know that for the previous DIPGs, the H3K27 is uh, something that shows a bad prognosis from the beginning. So we know some centers are doing more biopsies than before uh, in order to try 
to give some additional information. So I would like to hear your opinion on that. In what other situations do you believe that biopsy would be important? Uh, because we know we have an audience that comes from all over the world and we know it's not a resource really available everywhere. So where, where, it, where it would really make a, a difference? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, I have that question myself when I think about uh, DIPGs because first, it seemed like for a long time they were being biopsy consistently and then there was kind of a hesitancy to the biopsy of them because they were just based on imaging diagnosis. But as you're seeing, the molecular classification is very important. The H3.3 subtypes or H3.1 subtypes really help us understand these tumors because they, they all behave differently. And even in some cases where you think you know the diagnosis in the brain stem as far as you're saying this is a DIPG just on imaging. There's been cases where that's actually not the case. And so the biopsy will help us, uh, not in just neurology help understand these tumors on imaging, but to help the neurooncologist and uh, the clinical team to understand the behavior of the tumors. Um, because right now we haven't probably made the progress we want with um, treatment of DFPGs. So the more information we acquire, especially the molecular information that can be only be only obtained with the biopsy, um, that's going to help to lead to better treatment plans, I think, better understanding of these tumors. Um, so that's really why we need the biopsies um, to kind of help us down the road in understanding these tumors. And immediately as well, because those patients depending on the subtype, could be uh, treated differently even currently. So we have a trend towards more biopsy. Yeah. So I've talked to several people about this, and everyone I've talked to said biopsies are being done consistently at most institutions um, for these DIPGs and Thank most you. tumor. Yeah. So we have two questions here. One of them is from our colleague, Sama Shandana. Uh, could you explain more about the P53 mutation, uh, yeah, so specifically that, for brain tumors, I believe? Yeah, that's a good question. The P53, in general, the tumor suppressor gene, um, specifically how it relates to the tumors we're used to seeing it. It's a good question. Like, so that one case at the end where the siblings were, where you have the P53, when you have the mutation there, you're more prone to tumors in general. So I don't know how that would play a role in all the tumor types we're discussing, but in general, that uh, P53 mutation, you're prone to tumors um, in multiple sites. And I think in, this, in that case that I showed, uh, it just happened to be that kid had a, um, Sibling A had an ATRT and sibling B was prone to also uh, neoplastic development and had a core plexus carcinoma. Okay. So would you recommend contrast to all cases? Yes, 100%. If, as long as there's no contraindication to contrast and renal function, there's no, I mean, even in, in cases of renal function, you need to get, find the best uh, balance of trying to get contrast on board because when you're looking for metastatic disease, that can completely change the management of these patients. In a lot of cases, you're not gonna see the metastatic disease without contrast. We're getting better. So as the sequences improve, um, I think we got better sequences to help find metastatic disease without contrast. But at the same time, I don't think we're at, we're at a point or or even in the near future where contrast cannot be administered or you can avoid contrast, especially in the spine where you're looking for subtle leptomeningeal disease. Um, and a lot of these tumors, almost any tumor can present with metastatic disease. So for our protocol, as soon as we see that the patient has a brain tumor initial presentation, I we have a protocol that's in place where the brain imaging is completed. You give the contrast, you complete the brain imaging post-contrast, and then you run 
a few sequences of the spine post-contrast. You don't need to do pre-contrast imaging of the spine and post-contrast imaging. You can run your sagittal T2s and axial T2s post-contrast and your sagittal and axial T1s um, post-contrast. Actually, axial T2s if needed, so depending on the facilities, the resources available, but the point is contrast should be um, administered to look for metastatic disease in the spine, and that can be done um, after the brain imaging. So you give contrast for the brain, complete your post-contrast imaging of the brain, and then proceed the post-contrast imaging of the spine. Perfect. I have two more questions, please. So the first one about perfusion imaging. I saw you've shown some ASL cases. Uh, so do you currently do ASL for all cases? And in what cases would you do DSC or DCE? And if so, if you do a ASL for all cases, would you adapt your sequence for the weight of the child or would you personalize the parameters of the sequence? Yeah, good question. Uh, yeah, so currently if there's any new presentation of tumor or if there's any um, residual tumor, ASL is being performed in all those cases. And as a PCASL version of ASL, we would modify it if it was an infant versus an older patient. So the parameters are different because of cardiac, cardiac output variability. You would have to modify the sequence slightly just uh, um, specifically for infant versus older patient. So yeah, they are modified. In a, um, as far as the dynamic perfusion, so the DCE and the DSC, we've been a, it's part of our protocol currently. And so I, I got a lot of um, feedback from other institutions that have performed it. And a lot of trials also have uh, DC, DSC components to it or sequences within their research trials. So if you look at the PBTC, the Pediatric Brain Tumor Consortium, uh, they did a lot of DIPG work with dynamic perfusion imaging and showed some interesting findings just in understanding subtypes or understanding um, prognosis with these uh, uh, parameters or basically the permeability characteristics of dynamic perfusion imaging, I think is promising. I don't think we have enough literature to say that everyone should do it and it's a definite. To me, it's still something that should be researched and investigated to see um, kind of more in a prognostic, uh, if it gives prognostic information and also in the prospect of setting, can this, um, can this be helpful? So that's why I was including it in our tumor protocol here uh, to kind of get a feel for how it can help on a, on a more of a daily basis versus uh, in the research setting currently. But I think more work needs to be done, but it is a definitely a very interesting uh, imaging sequence that can be obtained to further understand these tumors, especially, especially when you talk about um, treatment response. I think that's where uh, the DCE, DSC will be very interesting. Very nice, thank you. So one last question, please, from our friend Ana Geraldo from Portugal. When should we suspect a susceptibility tumor syndrome in a child? Uh, which one is that again? I'm sorry. Uh, when should we suspect a susceptibility tumor syndrome in a child? Oh, well, I think I'm not 100 percent sure if that's um, that syndrome. Is that specifically just tumors in general? I don't understand the. Uh, I believe. She's talking about a genetic susceptibility tumor syndrome in a child. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, I think a lot of that comes with um, collaboration with your clinical colleagues and understanding um, the family history and getting the proper history and understanding uh, are these patients prone to multiple tumors or um, if there's a family history. So in those cases, just off imaging, it can be very challenging, but once uh, the clinical workup is completed and the genetic workup is completed is the only time that you can really be confident. But I think initially it is that conversation with the clinical team and understanding uh, is it 
patient prone to it, or are there other findings elsewhere outside of the central nervous system that would help you um, determine that this patient's prone to uh, genetic changes that predispose the tumors? Well, I guess that's all for now, all the questions that we had. And I would like to thank you once again for this wonderful and again, very comprehensive lecture. And it was very exciting to see the, the changes or a little bit of changes that we're going to take for the next classification. We're looking forward to that. And once again, from the whole world, thank you very much. Everybody is thanking you on the chat box. And um, that's it. Thank you. And we All see right. the next speakers from Philadelphia, sorry, from Pennsylvania soon. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank Good you. luck. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.